Hello and welcome to the Engineering Dynamics Course Companion. This is Class 3. Kinematics of particles, we're going to deal with curvilinear motion of particles in rectangular coordinates. And we're going to uh, uh, include uh, projectile motion and vector relative motion. So there's a lot of stuff to do today. Um, me and Wormy are here to uh, try to help you. So the bottom line up front, what we're going to cover today, we're going to review some um, vector addition. Um, specifically how to add components or use triangles. We're going to describe uh, the derivatives of vectors. I think we're doing that today. Um, where we have to take the, the derivative of the unit vectors if they change. That's an important thing. Um, we're going to deal with rectangular coordinates. So uh, we'll take a look at, and we're going to deal with two dimensions. So we have uh, the pos a position vector, a velocity vector and an acceleration vector in X and Y, using I and J as the unit vectors. We're going to deal with projectile motion, which is a special case, right, where we used uh, the constant, it's a constant acceleration uh, problem in the uh, uh, vertical direction, and it's a constant velocity problem in the X direction, right? Um, and we'll also look at uh, relative uh, vectors right here, right? So uh, uh, the relative motion is using vectors. And we'll have a really uh, cool example at the end. Now, I should point out, and I should have pointed out in the very beginning, um, and in each, uh, in each class, that you can always go down to the description and look at the table of contents, and there should be links uh, so that you could skip ahead uh, to where we have the example, if you want to cut through some of this general uh, uh, overview of the topics for the course. Now, vector addition is something that you should have done in statics, uh, and maybe even in uh, calculus, I think. Um, the basic idea is if we have uh, two vectors, D and E, and we're going to add them together, and we'll get a vector F, um, that we, if it's components, we could just add the individual components of D and E in the X direction and in the Y direction right here and come up with a new vector F, right? So if that's D right here and here's E, if we add dx and ex and add dy and ey, we have this new vector f right here. And you can see, as I've drawn this, it's also a triangle. So we're able uh, to use triangles. No, no, another way, aside from triangles, I've drawn it up here first. Another way uh, to see the addition of these uh, two vectors right there is to draw parallelograms right, to draw a parallelogram there, and I draw it in hash right there. So you could see here is the resulting vector f. Um, but we could also, if we want to get the magnitudes, right, from, uh, from, just the, for, from just the geometry right here, we can uh, figure out what all of the angles are based on the original vectors right here. And we know what the magnitude of D is. We know the magnitude of E. So we could use the law of sines or the law of cosines to uh, try to find the unknown um, length, F, and the unknown angles uh, or th that we, we need to get from there. It takes a little bit of geometry quite often uh, and uh, to try to figure that out. But uh, that's one method. Now, another topic um, that we need to discuss is a generalized discussion of taking the derivative of vectors, right? So if you have a generic vector P, capital P here, and it's multiplied by some scalar F right here, and, and the F, it could be a function of time, and also uh, P is a function of time, right? So it's just, they're, they're, they're both, um, you need to use the, um, uh, uh, I'm going to say the product rule. Is it the product rule? What's the name of it? Is it the product, product rule? I think so. Yes. Um, so we have to take uh, the derivative of f with respect to t times the original p, and then the original f times the derivative of p with respect to t. Now, if we have to, if we want to take the derivative of a scalar product, um, where here we have p dotted uh, with q, right? We're taking the dot product of those. Once again, we have to do the same thing, right? We have to uh, do the the product rule one after another. And then the same thing with a cross product, right? 
Um, so, like, let's say that we have a generic. Um, I think this is a review of maybe cross product. No, what is this a review of? We, we, let, let's say that the uh, P is a vector that has. Um, a, now, this could be any coordinate system. I decided to use E as the unit vector when it's generic, right? In a subscript one, in a subscript two, which means uh, that, like, um, like we, we could say that E1 is equal to I and E2 is equal to J, right? But, but uh, we'll be using other coordinate systems and there'll be other unit vectors, right? So this is a generic unit vector. Um, so if you take the derivative of P right here, so that's what this is the important part right here. We also have to do a product rule because this is actually right up the same thing right up here, right? In this case, this is the uh, potentially time varying uh, scalar and this right here is a vector. The unit vector is a vector. So we might need to take the uh, time derivative of uh, not only the, uh, the, the magnitude, uh, but we also of the unit vector right here. So here's the unit vector. And the same thing for P here and right here. If we want to completely take the derivative of a vector. But for rectangular coordinates, we find that we, we take di dt and dj dt, they don't change, right? So they if they have these vectors i and j right here, these unit vectors, they don't change with respect to time. So they just go to zero. Boom. And what you're left with is pretty self-explanatory. It might be what you just, the conclusion that you would just jump to. But the important part is this doesn't always happen with every coordinate system, which we'll see in the next class, uh, the next two classes. So this is an important point um, to, to make with respect to uh, uh, taking the derivative of vectors. Now, um, for curvilinear motion of particles, so this is just a short derivation here. Uh, we know that velocity, uh, we could find, we have average velocity, but we could take the limit as the, uh, the increment of time gets smaller and smaller. Um, and we could see if we're doing this in a curve, let's see, here's the position vector r, here's the position vector at a different time r prime, and so here's the delta r that's between those two. As they, uh, uh, you can see here is the uh, delta r delta t. As they get, it gets smaller and smaller, what you'll see is this velocity becomes tangent to the path. That is such an important thing, that velocity is always tangent to the path that it takes. And it's because, uh, just as you're seeing right here, right, as, as this little increment in here gets smaller and smaller and smaller, you can see that velocity is tangent right here. And so here's uh, just the stuff that we said in the previous slide. Um, you're t finding the uh, time rate change here, and we're getting x dot and y dot. That's another thing, another way that we could write the thing, right? Uh, when it comes to acceleration right here, uh, now if we have um, two different points along this curve right here, we could see uh, from this vector triangle um, that we, we actually start to have an inward facing vector, right? So this guy right here is, is moving towards the center. So what we'll find is we have an acceleration that actually has two components to it. Um, the point here, and we'll see this in the next class, two classes, when we have um, polar coordinates, uh, excuse me, path coordinates and then polar coordinates in that order, um, that there is a uh, an acceleration term that uh, is due to the changing of direction and there is an acceleration term that could possibly happen because the magnitude of the of the velocity changes right so there's two different ways uh, that we can uh, have an acceleration so acceleration is not tangent to the path whereas velocity is tangent to the path acceleration is not tangent to the path um, and uh, here we go. We, this is how we write out uh, acceleration. So projectile motion is a special case. And here we go. Wormy is getting thrown. Woo -woo. Um, it, it is a special, a special, special case of the special case of constant acceleration in the y direction, constant velocity in the x direction. Um, and when you combine those together, what you end up having is a, like a parabolic uh, type of shape. Um, 
And so like, this is a common breakdown of a projectile motion problem. Uh, there, there's lots of different ways that we can arrange a projectile motion problem. So um, it's difficult to have a cookie cutter. I mean, sometimes there's some pretty common givens and desireds, uh, but you can just change a couple things around and make a problem uh, pretty complicated. So you'll see that in the example. Um, so we will often take that initial velocity, right? Because once it leaves his hands, the velocity in the x direction is going to be constant. There's nothing, no forces acting on the thing. There's no acceleration, and assuming there's no wind resistance. I should point that out, right? But let's assume that there, the wind resistance is negligible, um, and uh, or air resistance. The velocity in the uh, y direction uh, initially is by the sine of this launch angle, right? So we're launching off right here. And so we have an, a y component and an x component. That y component is going to change. The x component is going to stay constant throughout the whole thing. Um, and the y component of velocity here, we could write out this equation uh, here. We have the initial uh, y velocity. And then, we, but we have a negative g because that's the acceleration, the acceleration of gravity, which is 9.81 meters per second squared in SI and 32.2 feet per second squared in uh, US customary units. Now, we don't use the inch per second squared. Uh, we'll find out that why later. It'll make a lot more sense. But it's important uh, that we memorize those two things. I often get students often ask during exams uh, for that value. So you should memorize that. Um, I give it to them. Okay, so uh, in the x direction, yes, uh, constant velocity problem. In the y direction, we have a, uh, a time uh, to the square right here, right? So we recognize uh, those forms of those. So, and then we could also potentially have uh, this relationship. It still holds true. This is usually useful, uh, only useful maybe. Um, it's probably other uses of it when we, we could set the velocity to zero. If we want to figure out where the peak is, we could figure, set this velocity to zero, and then we could find maybe this y. That's an instance where that's a, a useful thing. Um, but if we just combine these two problems together right here, these two equations, um, starting with this guy right here and rearranging so that time is, uh, we solve for time and then substitute it back in here and here, right? What we find, we can recreate, we can create an equation this long equation right here. And if you, well, it's a long equation. I, uh, this part of it right here is equal to y. And you could see that we have is a quadratic equation, right? And that defines a parabola, that parabola up there. So this is like y as a function of x. x is the only variable in there if we substitute those things in. And by the way, if we come back and we substitute these back in there, interestingly enough, we'll have a sine divided by a cosine, and we'll see that there's a tangent of that theta that'll often go inside there. And we'll see that people, we can, uh, that, that's some method that gets used sometimes. Okay, so uh, relative motion with vectors. Here's another topic that we need to uh, 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 combine into this. There's a lot of stuff in this class, um, but there's a lot of stuff that needs to be uh, crammed together in, the, in this part of the course. Um, relative position vectors right here. Uh, we, we could always say, you know, when, when we have a coordinate system that we're like a position vector is reference to O, right? So that's really our... A with respect to O, R B with respect to O, and then with the triangle right here, we have R B with respect to A, right? So those are the vector uh, versions of those relative motion type of things, right? And we know that we could take the derivative of this and get the velocity uh, relative motion and take the derivative of that and get the acceleration. Uh, there's nothing stopping us. That's totally fine and useful. So like here's an example thing just to, to give you a sort of an idea. Oh, like you could try to see what B looks like to A. Like A is the reference here with B. So this velocity of B with respect to A 
Um, you can see the velocity of B is larger than A right here. So you can kind of see this is what, uh, from the perception of A, what the velocity of Newt Dog and Wormy is going to be from the skier right here. And you can see um, all these different angles that you would, you, you would need to know uh, from this uh, to be able to break this down and use uh, vector triangles uh, to try to uh, solve this. Or you could also use components. So here is the example that uh, I've created where we have these twin brothers and they're shooting basketballs simultaneously from half court. Um, and I've used, the, the I think, the correct dimensions, actually, uh, for a basketball court here. Uh, both have the basket, uh, make the basket. And they're launching from the same initial speed. But Brother B launches his ball from a steeper angle than Brother A. And therefore, his ball goes into the basket after Brother A's. The half court to the center of the basket in a professional basketball court is 41.75 feet. And the rim is 10 feet high. Uh, the brothers launch the ball uh, from about 6 feet above the floor, right? Um, at a speed of 40 feet per second, right? Um, I think it's pretty fast. Anyway, what is the relative velocity of ball B to ball A when ball A enters the hoop? Okay, so you can maybe you could see here is going to be A and it's going to come in and it's going to land. Voop. And here's going to be uh, B and it's going to land bloop, right into there. So A is going to go in first. So it's going to go into this and it's going to be there's going to be like a, an arrow here of tangent, right? Um, so, so the ball B is going to be somewhere up here, and it's still going to be uh, flying up here. So we want to know what the, uh, the relative velocity of B with respect to A is going to be when that happens right here. So there's A and there's B. So these are word problems, and you need to kind of like look through the thing and uh, try, to, try to figure them all out. All right, so we start up by setting up the equations for uh, just one of the basketballs, right? Um, and uh, so right here, we have, um, this is one, this is point one I decided to do right here, and this is uh, point two. So the, in the x direction here, we have a constant velocity problem. We solve for time. Uh, we have a um, y direction uh, relative to the constant uh, relation for the constant acceleration. Uh, we have right here, we plug 1 into 2, just like I had um, in the previous slide. But here I've also uh, got the sines and the cosines. And you're going to see that, the, the interestingly enough, that initial velocity is going to cancel out, and then that's going to turn into a tangent right here, right? So uh, there you go. And we also have a cosine squared down below. Now, interestingly enough, okay, so one of the things, we don't know what the angles are going to be. This is what the type of, uh, one of the, uh, the, the more difficult um, projectile motion problems. Uh, that's why I chose it. Um, okay, so something that you might not know if you start digging around or might not remember, that uh, 1 over the cosine squared is the uh, secant squared right here, right? That makes sense because that's what a secant is. But that secant squared is equal to one plus tangent squared, right? That might not be one that you necessarily remember, so you have to dig around a little bit. Um, so if we plug that in there, right, we can move that cosine squared out and turn it into the one plus tangent squared. We have a tangent and a tangent. If we manipulate these around, of course, now I'm going to go ahead and stick in the constants that I know, like this initial position, the, the final position in the y direction, um, the, the initial velocity, uh, all these things right here. What we find and we manipulate around, we have a quadratic equation with tangent. So what we can do is we could just replace for the time being, that tangent of theta, so it doesn't look so ugly to us, with, let's call it z. Just picked a variable, z. And now we could take the quadratic equation right here, plug these guys in there, and we could find two values uh, of z right here, right here. And if you take now, if you take the inverse tangent of each of those you get a 36.43 degrees and a 59.11 degrees. So these are the angles that each of the, uh, the twins is going to toss the ball at and then be able to make the basket.
So there's one thing to you know, it, if you have a particular speed, there's always two possible angles uh, that, that you could have to be able to make the, the, the hoop uh, with that same speed. Interesting look, one is more of like a rainbow arc and one is more of like a, a, a much quicker path uh, to getting there. Um, so for a ball A, right, we could figure out um, what the, what, when his launch, ang uh, the, these two launch angles, we could figure out from uh, that equation for time, we could plug in um, all of those variables and, and now with the known angle, and we can get the time when ball A goes in, right? So now we can, and, and so from this, we could also find what the components of, the, we, of course, we didn't need to know the time here, but we did need to know the angle. Here's the components for um, the velocity of A in the X direction, and for the velocity of Y, right? We can use this relationship. Remember, we have an uh, acceleration of gravity, 32.2, and now we can find the velocity in the y direction. You can see that it's negative because it's going downwards, right? So we have a uh, x direction and we have a y direction. So here's the velocity of a right there at that time when it's going into the hoop. At the same time, right, we can find what the um, velocity of b is going to be. At that, at that, it's well. First off, in an x direction, it's just based on its angle, right? Because it's constant. So we had that original uh, thing, um, and now we can find the velocity of b, and it's and you notice it's going to be less negative right here, right? Um, so we're gonna, it's gonna have right here. Uh, so there's the velocity of b, right? Because we have the x direction and the y direction, right here x and y, and here we have x and y right here. So we have these two vectors uh, on top of each other, and I've superimposed, or I guess I've replaced uh, with a, a fairly good scale uh, drawing. This is actually a spreadsheet uh, plotted out, which is anachronistic, right, because I'm from 1687. And um, you can see here's, here is where the balls would be at that time. Um, so we could find the relative velocity uh, of these balls by uh, just taking these components right here and taking the velocity of B with respect to A. It's just VB minus VA. Just subtract them out and you will find here is the, um, the vector for the velocity. So we just want to get the magnitude of that and then we also want to get the uh, direction. And now we can answer with um, that it's going to be, uh, uh, well, the velocity of B looks like to A like it's falling away. So it's coming back away from the thing because A is going faster than B. If we're going to do with uh, uh, triangles right here, okay, or we just want to do it with the, uh, showing the vectors, and uh, quite often the triangle could be a complementary uh, solution when you're trying to uh, solve something. Uh, like we've solved it with components, maybe you want to use the, the triangles uh, to check it out. So if you want the velocity of B, we take the velocity of A and you add the velocity of B with respect to A to it, and that's what that looks like. All right, so for more examples, Check out the Engineering Dynamics Course Companion, Part 1 and Part 2, uh, published by Morgan and Claypool. Um, check the link down below. See, check, it, check them out. Right. And um, also, please uh, subscribe to the channel. I'll be putting up some more videos, and uh, hopefully this will help you out throughout the semester.